Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Kelly Doe. Kelly is the design director for Brand Identity at the New York Times, where, she, uh, where her work involves close collaboration with creative groups from across the company, including editorial, product, uh, corporate extended brand, and marketing. Some of her past projects include developing uh, prototypes for the first Times Reader, the redesign of the International Herald Tribune, and leading the 2014 rebrand of Times Video. Uh, Kelly's clients have included the museums uh, of the Smithsonian Institution, the National Archives, uh, news organizations and magazines in Asia, Europe, and Latin America, uh, plus a wide range of publishers, artists, and nonprofits. Uh, she recently completed the 75th year anniversary book for the National Gallery of Art and is consulting with the Freer and Sackler Museums of the Smithsonian on video installations there. Uh, and most appropriate to tonight's talk, uh, one of her current projects is a book and film on the visual history of the New York Times. Please welcome Kelly Doe. Is this good? Can you hear me? I have to lean into it like that. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I did just finish a book at uh, the National Gallery, and it was the process of that book, actually, that that uh, made me interested in getting involved in very long, intricate projects. Uh, and that was 75 year history of the National Gallery, but it allowed me to get into uh, their archives and really follow the path of the institution um, through its, through its uh, life cycle, if you will. And it was just fascinating trying to piece together uh, the visual, the, the narrative arc of it, and it, it got me all excited about doing that for the New York Times. So I, um, I started working on this uh, with David Dunlap, who is an editor and writer at the Times, and Jeff Roth, who uh, manages the Morgan Archives, and they have been tremendously helpful, and Phoebe um, Durrell, my assistant on this project, collaborator, uh, it's also been uh, priceless. Couldn't happen without any of them. So I just want to thank them first up. So um, letter forms as identity. Uh, when we talk about identity, we talk about uh, the visual face of something. Uh, it, it's what we present to the world, but we also talk about voice. We talk about tone. Uh, and we talk about values. So what makes up an identity is a mixture of these things, not just what's presented, but what feeds it, what's behind it. Uh, and, and in fact, the reason I love working with publications in the New York Times and in designing uh, information is that unlike a car or, or some other thing, it, it's basically invisible. And it's invisible until you give it form, until you give it shape, until you apply something to it uh, so that you can know it. And, oops, got to get these going. There, okay. So, so when you apply something, you, you can start to understand it. Um, Typography then becomes a, a primary method that, to shape a personality. And with great nuance, you can control, you can uh, bring to the world uh, what that thing is, how to understand it for what it thinks, what, what the beliefs are, what its values are. And uh, typography is an incredible tool uh, ha and can be used with incredible nuance. So I am. Um, I I was told that uh, um, I could go on, but I edited this down. But it could be uh, seven, eight, nine talks. But I will start with uh, what I have is uh, basically a narrative arc that goes through the very early days of the New York Times, and 
just to start to see how it's how it for, how it's formed, what shapes it, what technologies, what personalities uh, intersect with it, uh, what happens in society that also it changes because of, and how it also changes society. So uh, go really far back to these really beautiful early days of. This is uh, early 1700s, and these were more newsletters. They were uh, basically um, single sheets handed out, but the newspapers of the day, this is 1774. And you see these, they start to have a very similar structure, and it, it is uh, the essence of basically form-following function. The, the elaboration, the graphic expression came in when a header was put on top that was a permanent thing, but the efficiency had to be maximized to change this handset, very laborious. Uh, a lot of this uh, we found was five on five point type, uh, and which would not be happening today, that's for sure. <laughs> Although, so, um, so you, see, uh, you see things taking shape. Uh, as you go later, uh, broadsheets happened uh, big, in, in New York City in particular. There were many newspapers. The um, New York Herald was the first among them and uh, came up, it, it's quite a bit older than the New York Daily Times at that time and was run by someone named James Bennett. It was said to be one of the first papers in the modern era. Basically, it, it that was determined by the fact that it wasn't a niche publication. It tried to cover the major events of the day. It tried to be a part of the community. Uh, and the sun, uh, this bottom right one here, was what they call a penny press. And those were newspapers around at the time that came up and uh, charged one cent. Uh, and these other ones charged a few pennies more, but sort of undercut the competition at the time. In 1951, Henry Jarvis Raymond founded the, Daily, the New York Daily Times. So the paper was founded, the first building they were in was a six-story brownstone, uh, Nassau Street, downtown New York. The building uh, had no windows, no gas fixtures, and people worked by the light of candles. So uh, it was a primitive beginning, but many were at that time. And in 1857, made its first big leap forward by dropping the word daily. The, um, the papers changed over time, but very little. So you see here the shoulders of the paper or the ears, the ear areas of the paper moving down. And this is over uh, perhaps a few years that this happens. And I want to bring that back because um, at this time, the telegraph had been around for a long time, but as happens with every uh, technological development of any age at any time, there was, uh, in the Times, published a little piece about that that said, um, that said, superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth must be all telegraphic intelligence. Does it not render the popular mind too fast for the truth? So even then, the, it, shock, shock, horror. This is the first uh, Civil War map. Uh, it was uh, done in uh, most likely woodcut. And this is the uh, issue of Abraham Lincoln's death. And at the time, they didn't have a lot of tools at hand for a graphic expression, basically. So what, uh, what happened was they took the rules that you see on a regular, any regular day, and they took the rules and they just flipped them upside down. And the base of the rule is much wider than the one point or so or two at the top. So this gave them uh, a handy method for just upping the volume on their, on their print edition. They used these rules uh, continually and less and less as the, as the century went on, but we found some quite late in the century. The stacked decks um, uh, 
were a style of the time, turn of the century style of the time, and uh, happened to draw attention. And it was a very limited range, but uh, used sometimes to an extreme degree. And we call, we talk a lot at the New York Times about tone and voice and and uh, it'll come up later again, but when you look at these and, and the way they're written and how they flow down the page, they basically took probably one sentence from every paragraph and uploaded it so that you would have some impact. And the other conversation around this came up when um, someone had pointed out that perhaps in their type drawers they had run out of certain they had very limited amount of, of certain fonts so that they uh, used multiples to make up for the lack of one, one large drawer of type. In 1871, uh, this cartoon by Thomas Nass chose, uh, it speaks to the era of Boss Tweed. And Boss Tweed uh, was brought down by the New York Times famously uh, in their print edition. And uh, at that time, they printed, they printed uh, all of the facts that they had. And this was one of the first wide set front pages that happened at the New York Times. And uh, it sort of was the dawn of the era of, of printing uh, documents in full as proof. And it was a very interesting thing around this time was that the German immigrant population in New York City was very large. And we came across this edition, which is printed entirely in German black letter, exact same stories. Uh, and this was done presumably to uh, enlighten that part of the German population. And you can imagine them going down to the type shop and uh, hiring this out and wheeling the type back somehow and putting it on press. So uh, it, it's an interesting example of reaching out for broader audiences as we deal with so much now. I found this lovely artifact. It is uh, all the newspapers of the era in 1886. And what you can notice here is that there, there, there is a uniformity to them. Uh, there wasn't a lot of need to stretch or get graphic. There is also a, a lot of uniformity to their owners, I could say. <laughs> So change in this era, 1889, um, is relative. So when we look at these, uh, there's, there are little changes going on, but not major ones. And it was just slowly and surely things were redrawn or re-etched and moved forward. And here you can see uh, the beginning of some major kind of advertising, which we find in all different ways in this era it comes and goes. But it, it was a very interesting thing, and it comes back later in the New York Times because this uh, this was looked at as as a service to the reader. Um, it was, you know, we're offering you uh, news that is not just uh, journalism, but is also what you can find and where you can find it. So perhaps in that area, you could define this as service journalism. So in 1885, uh, the linotype. Uh, came into being, which changed basically everything. And the linotype, uh, the linotype was, there were many kinds of linotype made, uh, but the Mergenthaler linotype, which was made in Germany, ended up basically sweeping all the competition out of existence. And, and it changed everything because it set types in lines, and you could actually... Um, you could, you could, you didn't have to set letter by letter. About as from this the 15th century, the time of Gutenberg, to the latter part of the 19th century, the technique of typesetting remained the same. Though a press could print thousands of newspapers an hour, the printer still had to pick letters from a typecase one at a time and slowly form the required words, lines, and paragraphs. As a result, publishing was still a rather costly process. So there you see um, the origins of upper and lower case, because the upper case being upper and the lower uh, being lower. So, um, so linotype. So basically uh, making 
everything, making uh, the expansion of newspapers uh, in the, at the time went from a uh, few pages, uh, seven or eight pages, and then continued to, when the linotype came about, expanded uh, greatly. So the New York Times at one point uh, had more linotype machines than any other newspaper in the country, evidently. And I just couldn't resist this um, very beautiful piece where the leads go in. <laughs> That's the word leading. We're not going to go a lot into printing, but there's another word stereotyping that came out of this process with these matrices they made and this kind of printing. This paper would be used uh, to create very heavy uh, lead, lead plates that would wrap around the cylinders on the press. This shows those cylinders, and, and it is, um, it, it's just to note, you know, we were so removed from it now, but it is to note what, uh, what an amazing transition we've made. And this was heavy, dirty business making newspapers day in, day out. This is also, um, this is also uh, a similar thing that we have now is uh, distribution. The papers were not then distributed by the New York Times. They were distributed by, um, they were far, the, the distribution businesses were separate. So uh, you can see this is a, a clip from a little bit later era, but you can see how uh, laborious it is. It's basically a manufacturing industry. The ink also uh, had a lot of viscosity, so the dirtiness of the ink, the ink we have now has been really worked on to get it from sticking to your fingers. This, um, this this many of us at the times would find interesting because we uh, have the same problems now and this is a missive that went out asking people to please report on their dealers who they didn't control who perhaps sometimes didn't deliver the papers and it's sort of a a call out to say hey um, perhaps you can tell us who your news dealer is who's falling down on the job and in fact it is exactly similar to what happens today So, so we go on, and, and Adolf Oakes, um, in 1896, uh, purchases the New York Times for $75,000, which he borrows, and he puts himself in his publisher and proceeds to make a lot of changes. And his daughter, Iphigene, uh, was very interested in the newspaper, and, and even now, when I recently uh, sat down with uh, Al Siegel, who's the standards editor, uh, was for many years at the New York Times and then actually became the New York Times standards editor, uh, said that Iphigene's influence and impact was dramatic as the paper grew. And here she is as a, as a little girl, but um, it is a, uh, he, he, the way he put it was that being in the newsroom, you always had them looking over your shoulder, Iphigene. So the family had a great influence on uh, what, the, what the New York Times was, and she in particular. So this is looking at uh, changes that he instituted immediately. He took out the hyphen, and he was a pretty savvy character and, invent, and decided that uh, he would invent a catchy phrase, all the news that's fit to print uh, at the time. And he then went about uh, having a contest. And this is the idea where in the, the, the first sort of dawn of the era of reader engagement, if you will. So he has a contest and gets everyone involved in writing slogans for him, 10 word slogans for him. And uh, the, the winner, of the contest was all the world's news, but not a school for scandal, um, which they 
which he said, yes, that's very good, but it's not as good as mine, so we're not going to use it. <laughs> and that's what we have today. He entered the newspaper business at a crazy time. So this was a time of uh, what is now, I didn't realize, but what is what was the yellow journalism era. And newspapers, because of linotype, because of expansion, had a, an ability to print many, and they were basically at war with each other. So the New York Journal and the World um, were, uh, you see on their front pages fighting, basically, for readership. And they actually ratcheted up this fight so much that uh, it was said that they basically started the Cuban-Spanish War by their headlines, which um, some would debate. But you see here, also, the New York Times choosing the high road. <laughs> And the, the wood type at that time, these beautiful, huge headlines, um, is sort of a heyday. But this is a decision made by the family. They chose to stay dignified. They chose to um, uh, be mindful of uh, the readership and who they were aiming for. It was a very calculated move not to go down this other path. This is a little more blunt. Not quite so calculated, but this was an ad that they put out at the time uh, to really solidify that uh, in case you were missing it. In 1900, there was a lot going on technologically, and Adolf Oakes took advantage of it. So the history of the times, uh, you know, we think of this old gray lady, and what, what we now apply is really wanting to uh, well, there's no comparison, but when we look at that era, the New York Times jumped into things. And while these papers were working with uh, comics and getting people uh, entertained, Adolph Oakes made the decision to uh, go ahead and do an illus illustrated supplement. This was printed on copper plates. It was very expensive. It was... Uh, one might say calculated risk, but it had a lot to do with how he wanted to build this um, reputation as being of great value. He then started a book review, uh, and this is, a, a, you see this one in 19, or 1896, and then in 1901, a little bit of forward motion uh, with, the, with the design of it. He started a financial report, and uh, he invested, and at the, at the time, when you look at newspapers stacked up and you uh, look at the price of them, it is, it is quite a wild fluctuation. He decided to drop the, drop the price at one point after all this investment uh, to gain readership uh, to one cent. So the circulation at that time was 25000 and with a, with a price that went down to one cent, it went up to 76000 So he gained massive readership by that and and it is something that we're we're still doing this today uh, in many different ways but what is the balance you have wherein you can actually be of good service to the public you can sell advertising you can uh, keep afloat so even then you see you see this starting uh, back in the early days the first front page photo was in 1910, and this was also a moment, uh, perhaps well chosen, that they had uh, sponsored a flight, Curtis's flight from Albany to New York at that time. And it is, uh, it, what, what it suggests or what it brings up is that, uh, the idea that, you know, we have all these rules now about sponsorship and uh, where and how and why and what's good for us, but it was in early days a, a decision, again, to sponsor something. They could get attention by it, but it did fit in with their values. This was, you know, a, a technological feat. It, it spoke to progress, uh, if not scientific endeavor of some sort. So it, it was self-serving, but it was also uh, covered a lot of other bases. And they had, these are hand-drawn bulletins that they put outside the times of, in the era to advertise this. 
This is 1912, and, and this was the first sign of these large banner heads, and uh, the New York Times choosing to uh, keep rather quiet underneath the banner, and the world uh, using larger typography, more easy access, but uh, in the reading about the world, it was true that the world had its sort of BuzzFeed moment, and then actually it became quite a good paper after that. So um, that whole, uh, the ebb and flow and how newspapers responded to their public is really interesting to watch. Rotogravure just happened uh, right about that time in 1914, and again, Oakes looked at the landscape and what other papers were doing and made a calculated bet, perhaps a risky bet, to invest in really high quality images. So Rotogravure, um, uh, this first piece that he engaged with on his Rotogravure press was uh, uh, the same kind of idea of engaging the readers. And these were, uh, this is a, another thing that he um, created at the time where people would send in, it was, it was a contest of sorts, and people would send in photographs of their uh, girlfriends, wives, sweethearts, and, and he had a group of artists judging them. And these <laughs> artists, these, uh, these American artists, of which only a few of which you might recognize their name, um, judged, and then they appeared in this edition, which uh, sold out, all the dealers sold it out in advance. <laughs> again, uh, again, a very early investment, a very early uh, sort of commitment to high quality images. This is a midweek pictorial. This is a, a spread by John Singer Sargent that was run. Uh, eventually the Times bought their own photo engraving plant, so just went full on into it. So 1920s, uh, they, there was um, a lot going on, and the Times looked at, uh, it's just interesting to see how these things come up, and they started becoming uh, more self-consciously the paper of record. So they started printing uh, in this very small type uh, these uh, treaties. They printed the Treaty of Versailles. They printed uh, president's, a president's address. They would print uh, the full text. And people, of course, read more then. But it was sort of multi-purpose in the sense that um, just sort of putting a stake in the ground and becoming the paper of record. 1922, they printed the whole Declaration of Independence on one of their pages. And it's not as easy now uh, with the narrow width of the paper, but this continued on to this day. So if you get the New York Times on July 4th, there's the Declaration of Independence. Uh, they had uh, advertising was a really interesting thing at that time as well. So uh, advertising at the Times um, was very carefully handled. And as we saw earlier, was looked at as sort of an equal offering to the public. This, this in particular was a contest that, another contest, <laughs> that, um, that continued on for several years that they gave uh, some text to the, to the public, and all of the typographers nationwide would go ahead and set the text in what they thought was the best presented ad. And uh, we found these books. They, the Times would then print all the ads uh, in a book with first place. And this first prize winner uh, says, strictly a newspaper without comics, without puzzles, without equal incompleteness and quality of news. Its advertising columns are informative, clean, trustworthy. Read the New York Times, it's a liberal education. So, so these ideas and, and uh, really setting up the positioning of the Times as something that um, wasn't fun. You weren't going to 
uh, do a crossword puzzle, basically. This is a, an interesting uh, page from 1931. They, the beginning of the first one we found where the Times is, is uh, celebrating themselves. And they reproduced um, covers past glorious moments. You see here Boss Tweed at the top and um, past glorious moments in their history. So this becomes a, an artifact of public interest. It's, it serves their purpose of keeping their uh, messaging how much quality they've brought into the world and, and um, does a lot of different things. So um, again, moving on with technology, uh, wire services um, came into being in the 20s or so, and the New York Times uh, jumped on it. And this, these are photos from the archives of the New York Times. Um, and they started a wireless service, and within a few years it became the world's most extensive uh, wireless news gathering operation. Uh, the Times in Times Square, uh, which some people don't realize anymore that that's why you call it Times Square, but uh, they, in, in um, 1928, they put into place the Motograph News Bulletin, uh, which was called in shorthand a zipper. And this was... Um, had electric lights that blinked off and on and went around, and the first message on that was Herbert Hoover defeats Al Smith. And it was quite a, a thing in its day. It was on from 5 to 12 midnight. So uh, Arthur Hayes Salzberger uh, was put in charge in around 1935. He had married Iphigene. Uh, against the wishes of her father, Adolf Oakes. Uh, they married in 1917. He wasn't a newspaper man, so uh, he wasn't deemed a good mix for carrying on the newspaper line in the family, but he proved himself and became an extraordinarily good uh, publisher and did a lot uh, in his day, and we'll go through that. The, um, in 1941, the body text went from seven to eight point ideal. And normally uh, we would think nothing of that, but at that time uh, and in future times that we'll look at, to replace the text of your newspaper basically meant that you had to clean out uh, an incredible amount of lead and in particular the matrices that uh, Per, that made that alphabet what it was. So it was not a cheap thing, but as you see over time, the investment in that, and as things progress to invest in more clarity, and this is not a big step up. So uh, they deemed it worth taking, though. Uh, and expanding again in 1943, the uh, Overseas Weekly was published uh, first in Tehran, and the Overseas Weekly was the edition of the News of the Week in Review that went international, and it, they started this as a way to uh, improve troop morale. Later on in 1946, uh, they published, they broke down and published <laughs> crossword puzzles, <laughs> finally. And, um, but this was for, this was to cheer up those left at home, is how they put it. A, a response for people in need of relaxation. Los Angeles, uh, they sent an edition out to the West Coast, um, and they acquired a radio station, uh, WQXR, for a million dollars at the time, which was uh, a steep price, and they proceeded to um, like podcasts, they proceeded to uh, broadcast the news from the radio station every day. The advertising and edit uh, relationship um, was very different in newspapers and uh, was basically newspapers were their own ad agencies. Uh, they did all the, all the work on the ads um, and uh, 
Dalgin, who we see here, um, was the art director not of the promotions department, but of the newspaper. But he formulated the paper's typographic standards in 1922. There are a lot of these books of typographic standards around. Um, and <coughs> he basically, he held the paper steady for, what, 30 years. These are advertising standards, and it's kind of fascinating because what the Times did at that time was make a decision to, uh, that lasted quite a long time to protect the environment, the whole environment. So if you had too much black in your ad, if you had uh, bad half tones, if you had, they were really comparing themselves to other papers whose ads were really terrible and promoting that as, you have this environment. This one in particular, New York Times Advertising Standard says, to protect the readers of the New York Times, every advertisement offered for publication is subject to censorship and must conform to the Times standards and conception of a newspaper's obligation to the public. So this, is, this whole document, this whole preface to the advertising standards is quite interesting. So they decline advertising that's fraudulent, misleading, doubtful, or detrimental to public welfare. These elegant little books, um, there are many to be found. And they speak to the physicality of the process. It was uh, a large newsroom. People had to understand what was going on. There was a high level of craft and care put into this work and, and sort of uh, advertising qualities were in that way that they were promoted equally by uh, edit and advertising. So there are a lot of these. This one in particular is um, a specimen book uh, by which you would choose, you, you, if you were Macy's for example, you would come in, choose your font, and uh, your typeface and they would make up your ad for you. And Macy's had its own drawer, it had a uh, uh, an extra large caslon in that drawer be brought out when Macy's wanted their ads. The, um, the style books also uh, were made and updated in the newsroom. Everything was documented uh, to the extreme because you had a lot of people working with uh, making, the making of a thing that was quite complicated. And these books, uh, had indications for copywriting. They had, uh, ha you know, what headlines should be set in what style. Uh, everything was put in these, and they, um, as I said, were updated. Uh, there are many of them around over the years. Uh, what you see here on the left is um, nomenclature that was built up out of the newsroom for headline demarcation. So you would know. Uh, you could just shout across the room, A head or Q head, and A head meaning the lead on the far right of the page, and a Q head was uh, meant to be a news analysis piece, not so uh, immediate. These, stacked, these, these staggered uh, headlines were around in a part of the New York Times, well, until this day. But uh, in, in our discussions about finding, uh, relaxing our voice, uh, reaching different kinds of readers. Um, it, it's often referred to that we have a, um, a, a, an overly dignified tone. And the thing that I find fascinating is these headlines uh, that were written over uh, decades in the same way were, were formed in a way by the constraints of the page. So, uh, they, they often were in extremely poetic. Uh, they had structures that over the years evolved, and so, um, as Al Siegel was telling me uh, in my discussion with him, he was saying that each line had to have its own uh, beginning and end, basically, be a contained thought. So uh, not only was that a commitment made uh, to a way of speaking, but it was also expensive because you had to have enough editors in the newsroom to be writing uh, and dedicated to this. Uh, the thing that also came up as I was researching was that Einstein was sort of a rock star of his era. <laughs> <laughs> so you have these headlines like, 
everyone loved him. They followed him. He was on the front page all the time. So you have these headlines like, people colossally bored. And, <laughs> and <laughs> the 4,000 bewildered. But 4,000 people showed up to hear Einstein and then be bewildered. It's sort of an amazing thing. Um, and and there, are all, there are stories that do come up about his, um, his astonishment at the American public who would show up, actually, like what, could not understand it. This is the origin of, uh, of the word logotype, actually, because when they were making these staggered headlines, they really needed to fit a verb next to the name. And when Eisenhower came up, his name was too long to fit even uh, four letters next to. So what they would do is call uh, intertype, their, their type house, and they would have these um, letters drawn a little bit skinnier and made up into basically a, a kind of a slug that could be used so that they can then fit, uh, as you see here, the word new next to it. The 60s were a, a really incredible era for design. And, you know, in a way, as you look at the history of the times, it's a push and pull, and things move forward in advance, and things slow down and stay steady. And uh, the 60s were a really interesting era because Lou Silverstein uh, was hired by. Uh, Korean, and he was brought in after a recent stint at the State Department doing the propaganda magazine for Russia called America. So he came to the Times. He started in promotion, uh, the promotion department, which um, when he started in the promotion department, it was, as it's been until very recently, uh, a uh, place where you stayed. You worked on advertising, if you're in advertising, and if you were in the newsroom, you worked on news. This wall was really uh, complete. And along the way, um, uh, when he um, became design director, so to speak, art director at that time, um, they made him art director of news and business side. So he sort of broke the mold, and this was, um, not exactly bloodless was the way it was put to me. A very uh, dynamic uh, time of change. So uh, this is Al Siegel's um, brand architecture, basically, looking around the company. Uh, at that time, there was the radio station. They had other companies. They had other newspapers, I'm sorry, that uh, they owned. And he's trying to figure it out here. He also began immediately to modernize um, and refresh everything. And this eagle had, um, was a family favorite. And he basically changed and wiped everything out and made what uh, is quite a beautiful modern logo at the time uh, that is really hot type, basically, NYT and hot type. This um, was fondly called the piano keys. He then uh, took the masthead, uh, the, the logo type on the masthead, and removed the period. Um, and he had Ed Benguet <coughs> redrew this for him. Uh, he worked with Ed, and they made the thicks thicker and the thins thinner. Uh, really, the origin of what we have today uh, is this Benguet drawing. Um, this is a book out of, this is a page out of his book, Lou Silverstein's book. And he's talking about what a hard time he had um, getting this approved uh, because nobody wanted to take this period off. And there was a production manager, um, a production manager in his department did this calculation and came up with this number that if this period, the ink, this period used over the course of one year totaled some, <laughs> what we have $400, $600 or something. And, and Lou said, ah, oh, that did it right away. They just completely came, <laughs> took that period off. He said, they never said a word about the drawing, actually. It was only the period that they were focused on. And this was a, you know, he, he ushered in this era that we still have, which is this amazing relationship that Times has with um, really talented, a really interesting universe of 
uh, people that we work with. And uh, this is uh, Robert Frank at the time was a photojournalist, and Lou picked him up and had him start shooting ads uh, that are astonishingly beautiful when you look at these photos. And uh, the sort of cleaning out all of this, you know, weightiness and really fresh, really modern work. Um, they, being their own ad agency, they came up with all of their own work, and this was one of the longest running ad campaigns the New York Times ever had. Um, very familiar. And uh, even uh, how uh, crazy modern these look now, this is on the left. Uh, he came up with this idea to basically stripe the paper and send it out to people as th they can make their own pressman's hat. You know, the pressman wore these hats made out of paper to protect the, keep the ink off. And on the right is a Christmas card. Um, in the course of this, uh, I've had long conversations with Matthew Carter, a uh, designer, type designer, we, many of you know. And he had amazing stories about this era of uh, basically type poaching where intertype uh, intertype would just steal fonts. They would steal typefaces and we had these books in the archives and they're basically exactly the same and one is called Helvetica and one is called Newton Medium and that was, uh, that was a very inexpensive, inexpensive way for intertype to uh, sell their, their wares, uh, Optima turned into Chelmsford. So uh, when I asked uh, Matthew about how this, how could they do this, he said basically the legal system or lawyers, even up until this day, are very nervous about, I think they've gotten over it by now, but about copyright laws. And he said in that time, lawyers were actually worried that they might accidentally copyright the alphabet. So here are some of Lou's sketches. Uh, at, at that time, there was a lot of sketching, and we have uh, our chief creative officer today um, still sketches things uh, when necessary. But these are Lou's sketches, and the thing that um, the thing that this uh, reminds you of is newspapers. Uh, they had an incredibly detailed amount of stuff in them. So you had to design the stock tables, the television listings, you, everything had to be worked out, small, medium, and large. And you know, we don't think a lot of that anymore because it's, uh, let's try this in you know, five point. But uh, at the time he did these, uh, w there are thousands of these, or okay, hundreds of these drawings. Uh, he uh, changed the typeface from ideal to imperial. And uh, when you see this 500,000 matrices, that's referring to the linotype machine matrices. And not only did those matrices have to change out, but newspapers often set type and had it laying in wait. They had it sitting ready to go. So you would, might have an obituary or you might have something uh, ready to go because typesetting took so long. And they, they had to clean out everything they had set in ideal uh, that was there as well. So uh, no small thing, but again, an investment in um, clarity, legibility, if you will. Uh, Intertype took the opportunity to invite, the, invite other newspapers to buy Imperial, since it was so brilliant. And, and as Matthew Carter told me, he thinks it's probably one of the only faces that they actually drew themselves. So, uh, and it, it is a, it is a, it's a, a very useful, um, actually quite beautiful uh, text font. You see here, uh, present and future, before and after, and and you're, you know the kinds of analysis. You know as this has happened in later eras. The kinds of analysis over, you know, saving every spare speck of story space and legibility, but balancing that out with how many words you might lose, and the editor saying, <gasps> ten words off that. 800 word column? No way. So it's, it, is a, it is a science and an art to make something both beautiful and economical in this way. So Lou um, took things and 
really uh, sort of cracked them open and broke a lot of new ground in the design of the newspaper. And he was looked at um, as a leader in his field uh, during his whole uh, tenure there. And this is a, we can judge this any way, but for the time, it was a remarkable thing to have some photograph going into type and what have you, and these were extremely bold and even today look quite contemporary. Uh, as far as design goes, they did these new features because they had um, advertising that could fill them and it was a great opportunity and they took advantage of it. So these, uh, they did uh, home, science, travel and uh, the writing at the time made reference to this as being both a boon for advertising and a boon for the reader. So it's really a, an expansion of what the New York Times was. And these were incredibly popular. This one I should point out was uh, these layouts were done by Tom Bodkin, who is now the COO of the New York Times in his early days. You see here... Um, playing with layout, but you also see looking at uh, naming and nomenclature. What are we going to call this? So the leisure department um, didn't make it. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a little story about the moon landing. And what you see here are, are editors who are um, working on the planning that went into it was astonishing. And they're proofing copy here on the right. But uh, it was basically months of planning, and John Noble Wilford had uh, a book in the works that he was working on and got published after the moon landing, and many things were organized around this, and a lot of effort went into it. So during the time, they, um, during the, the launch and the whole event, they had, the New York Times had a direct line into uh, the NASA control room in Florida, so they were hearing directly and being uh, actually playing a part in a way, uh, getting information right away out of that. And uh, they had set up um, the biggest headline that they had ever set up, which was this men land on moon. But they had to, they had um, uh, set up actually three headlines. So the first one was men land on moon. The next one was Men, man walks on moon, and the third one was men walk on moon. Just in case, you never know, but it was ready. And, and to think of the time, you know, we just change a headline now, but they really had to have stuff prepared. Uh, this is century point, century old style, the headlines at the time, and then they blew them up photographically. There was also a poem on the front page, which if you think of the New York Times now, how nice that would be, but uh, those days are over. And, uh, and the poem also had to be written uh, well in advance. So in the, even no one knew what was gonna happen, all of these things had to be prepared. The, um, the press run for the moon was 950,000, which was uh, 85,000 more than usual at that time. And uh, people got angry that they didn't have one if they didn't. So they all came to the Times building, uh, stormed the Times building is the word that's used. And uh, on the Monday after, they printed another 75,000 copies. And those ran out. And then they printed another 100,000 copies. So it's an interesting thing when you think of uh, what role the newspaper plays in society and how um, these were tangible mementos, memorials, marking an event. Um, and, and it's happened since. It was the same when uh, Obama in 2008, people lined up outside the New York Times. The Pentagon Papers, another crazy production tale, uh, more production than typographic maybe, but uh, the Pentagon Papers, um, many of you know, uh, many of you may know, were, uh, when the New York Times came into uh, came to have um, uh, documents that basically told the whole story of the Vietnam War uh, that the public had never seen, never knew about, um, a lot of things that had been kept from the public. So it is sort of the, in a way, if you want a, a contemporary um, comparison, it would be like WikiLeaks. 
but these were hard copies. So the Times rented nine rooms at the hotel across the street under lock and key, top secret. And those nine rooms, they, ha they were filled with these folders and documents and they went ahead and started editing and writing. So what you see um, on the left here is the letter from the State Department asking the Times to cease and desist uh, printing. And on the right is a list of people who were allowed to go in that room and they chose only the most uh, long-term employees. It was very top secret. And what they did in the, at the New York Times was they took a composing room, they built a composing room on the ninth floor of the Times. Uh, again, nobody allowed in. And the linotype machines by then were run by tape. And the, the, they would, as I was told, in the dead of night, bring the type up from the linotype machine, set it on these big, heavy, uh, big, heavy steel tables, and then also um, take it on the elevator down and run it on the press. So just to get something done at that time was so phenomenal and uh, uh, top secret as well. The op-ed page came into being right around this time and the op-ed page standing for opposite editorial, which wasn't a new idea. Opposite the editorial page, a columnist often appeared. But what the Times did in uh, 1970 was say that they wanted to expand the conversation. They wanted to bring in a lot more voices. And uh, for they were really the first paper to do this where they reached out to academics and uh, notable people of the day uh, and started printing columns at that time. And, and they also, the art direction at the time um, was phenomenal because they made a decision which we take for granted now, but at the time, uh, editorial cartoonists were the art. And what they did at that time was uh, really put a stake in the ground and say, we want the art to be as evocative and singular as the edit. So they started hiring illustrators, Brad Holland and, and different people at that time, uh, Eastern European. Uh, they started hiring illustrators to tell their own stories and basically combine them. Uh, typographically, probably, I just put this in here, but uh, Mirko Illich, when uh, he was working at the op at, at, on the opinion section, did the most astonishing uh, typographic arrangements and um, must have had a brilliant relationship with the editor, uh, I have to say, to get all that done. <laughs> so here we have the last metal type. Uh, in uh, July 2nd, 1978, the last metal type version of the New York Times. So this is, um, this is a day from one day uh, to the next, these plates uh, turning into, uh, there were many sort of evolutions from hot to cold type, but one of them was this one going uh, to this very thin substrate, uh, photoresponsive substrate material. And this is a, a part of a film that uh, speaks to that. Motor off. A last touch of familiar brass mats. Light out for good. It is the end of the age of hot type mechanical printing. And the beginning of the new, the computerized cold type, the electronic. These seasoned printers retrained have made the transition from the old to the new. So, um, it was estimated that over the next years, probably 900 jobs uh, were lost to that. And when you see, um, when you think of the, when you think of what Linotype meant, and the, even then, the, the physicality of it and the, the 
the sort of industrial engagement that people worked in every day, and then just to go from one to the next is sort of in, incredible. This was um, one of the computers that was built especially for the New York Times, uh, Interdata. So uh, the 80s, time, um, time goes on, and I thought I would just give a hat tip to uh, our CCO, Tom Bodkin, who is seen here in his, uh, in the bottom right photo of his yearbook. Uh, he was, Tom came to the New York Times uh, after being at CBS, working with Lou Dorsman. Here's Lou and uh, Lou Dorsman and Herb Ballin, uh, from which this lecture series is named. And uh, proceeded to work in different places uh, in the newsroom. Us Magazine, the Time Zone Us Magazine uh, at that point, and Tom worked on that for a while, and then they uh, pulled him into the news side, and, uh, and as uh, Lou stepped away and Roger Black had an interim, and then Tom came in as the art director, and this is, uh, believe it or not, 1993 when the first color uh, came in. And that came in only to the feature sections. So uh, Tom uh, was involved in the first color uh, ever printed on the front page of the New York Times. And he went to, uh, uh, working with Joe Lelyveld, he went to meeting after meeting after meeting, trying to convince people to just put a simple color photo on the front page. And uh, finally, in frustration, he made these. Um, he made these and took them to the presentation uh, uh, just to make people understand how crazy they were being. And, and uh, as, one, as one in some other time might imagine, the circulation department really liked that one on the left. <laughs> So, so color, um, so color came to the front page, and uh, they had a lot of um, they had a lot of complaint about it. One uh, one person uh, actually using the word harlot. As far as <laughs> <laughs> so it goes, and here is Tom and Joe Lelyveld looking at proofs uh, at the printer. So. Um, Tom had a lot of ideas about how to make the paper, uh, actually think about the paper a little differently and relax uh, the newsroom a little bit and bring in more photography and, and get pages to be more engaging and alive. And the, um, the thing about the 90s is they were, uh, at the dawn of the digital era, is they were crazy. When you think of all the things that overlapped at that moment. So this is the first New York Times on AOL <laughs> in 1994. Uh, it then really went crazy. And this is in 1996, uh, uh, the Times, uh, the New York Times on the web in particular. And this goes all th actually all the way up to 2007 when uh, Razorfish did a redesign. but. The thing about the web is, as we all know, and as we can see here, is whatever identity the Times built over 150 years, whatever, uh, is gone. There is very little you can do control, uh, even in the most sophisticated ways and uh, ad attempts. So what happens? What happens? Where does the identity lie? is the question. And ever since uh, the digital age, it's something that we actually ask ourselves all the time um, for different reasons now. In 1994, at the same time as, as we were being drained of identity, uh, Janet Froelich was working on the magazine and doing some of the most incredibly sophisticated work uh, of, of, the, of the decade, really. And, uh, Adam Moss uh, came at that point, and Janet and Adam Moss proceeded to redesign the magazine. And 
Janet had used, uh, had done a lot of work at the magazine. Diane LaGuardia had hired her there and she had been there and working on, they had a way of using typ typography that, that, you know, this here you see Latin condensed here, but they really spread out and did a lot of different things. Um, and when she did the redesign, uh, she really thought about um, how to do the redesign with, with, and actually build more tethers to the print, the, the newspaper. So she looked at uh, Chelt, which is one of the, one of the uh, typefaces that the newspaper was using, and she hired Jonathan Heffler, and they went about making a new family of Cheltenham, which is quite, as you would as you would think, astonishing. And she used stymies, which were also in use in the magazine, even back in the 50s, the, the magazine had used these stymies. And here you see, uh, um, sadly fading away, uh, waterfalls of these that she paired together. And she brought in uh, Matthew Carter, and Matthew do the heavier stymies, and Cyrus Highsmith do these lighter weights, which it's so light, unfortunately. It's so beautiful, this stymie thin that he drew for the magazine. Um, but this was her typographic palette. And you can see it in use here. I don't have a lot of these, but um, it, it was such an interesting thing because she's, she uh, took these these typefaces out of the newspaper and used them in a way that exactly mirrored what the magazine was to the print publication to the newspaper. So the stories are longer form, the ideas are, are let loose a little more, the range is wider, and the typography exactly mirrored that which that thing was. So uh, it was uh, quite an amazing, uh, quite an amazing, uh, beautifully realized piece of work. She also had um, uh, Matthew work on the, ma the logo. Uh, the logo uh, was cleaned up at this time as well. And here you see uh, all the way up to 9-11 um, and on. Janet also worked on T Magazine. And T Magazine came about because uh, there was very healthy advertising at the time and there was room uh, for another publication. They, they determined that it would hold up. Uh, they ran the numbers and made T Magazine to be the fashion style uh, component, which stepped even further out. So you had the newspaper, you had uh, the, the Sunday Magazine, and then you had T. And this is Janet's first drawing of that fat T. And this is Matthew Carter's uh, beginning work on what they collaborated on, where, where to go with it. So these are the first T's, and I think the lower right one is uh, one that ended up um, getting, getting used. And this is, a, this is a, Janet had a book at home, and she gave me this page out of it, and she said she did these often when she was working out type problems, and she basically made these sketchbooks. So this is Janet's sketchbook with the stymie, the chelt, and the fracteur. And she, uh, you know, Ed Benguet had drawn a fracteur for the New York Times long ago uh, uh, for photo lettering. And, you know, as things all get lost, it got lost. And so um, uh, they picked up the pieces at the, the, the letter forms that were in the in the logotype, and Matthew built out a whole font of Fracteur for Janet. And uh, this is, a, this is a, a publication for the launch of T that I'm using here, which uh, is, design, is actually designed by someone who's at the Times now, Melissa June, beautiful, beautifully realized. And this was the launch of T. And you can see in these spreads, um, the use of the fracture. So, you know, as you step away and you step out and you step up and you sort of elevate this publication to a place where the way you're using the typography is speaking to what's in the magazine, which is speaking back to the newspaper in the most elegant way.
I just put a series of T's in here because Janet, again, um, continuing on uh, using artists of uh, everywhere in the world of all types to build these T's. And this is a, a fraction of them. As you see here, there's, uh, we have a whole archive and it's incredible. This is more tea love. Um, people go to great lengths. So uh, as Tea Magazine, as the Sunday Magazine is going along, Tom Bodkin was also working on redesign of uh, the, the newspaper. And um, is that a word? So, so uh, this is, this is um, not the redesign of the newspaper. This is earlier than that redesign. But so Tom, um, being in the newsroom, being in charge at that time of 9-11, uh, uh, was in charge of this day where from 9 a.m. in the morning until 9 p.m. at night and consecutive closes, they basically cleared every ad out of the section and proceeded to build 27 pages of new material. So that's 27 pages ad-free of new material in a day um, that one, it's just hard to imagine. But Tom, having looked over and been working with the art directors in the newsroom uh, on, on uh, art edit, uh, photo edit, ratio, uh, photo edit ratios and these kinds of things, produced these pages. And this is actually a mix of that day and f further days. But uh, he said he gathered them together. He basically gathered them together. They had um, a bit of a, a war room and they built the pages simultaneously all together. So as the day evolved and the stories came in and news came in, uh, he could watch the pacing of those pages and see where things were and see, uh, just make sure everything sort of rose up in the same way to the same degree of uh, refinement. That day spawned uh, a Nation Challenged, which was a separate section that was produced. And, and it was, the Times at the time only had room to print four sections. And so what Tom decided and, and those around him decided was that they would take the sports section and turn it upside down and print it on the back of the Metro section. So. This went on for a year. People got their sports upside down on the back of Metro, and also uh, probably a lot less stories in it, perhaps. But um, this is a this is a company decision to go full force into something, and whatever you had to do to make it the best it could be. Uh, however, uh, you had to distort things or make do. Um, it's actually quite a quite a beautiful contemporary um, effort. When 9-11 happened, uh, there was an anniversary issue sitting on pallets in a warehouse because these things are printed uh, far in advance often. So late August, early September, this multiple page uh, uh, celebratory um, issue was sitting on pallets and uh, had been put together. and. Inside that publication was an ad that Weinstein had taken out saying, uh, big deal, very. And this was, to, this was to advertise his new floor space in the World Trade Towers. So uh, that, whole, uh, that whole issue that was going to be hand inserted was basically pulped um, because they were not going to distribute this, obviously, with the Trade Towers in it. You see here a very robust use of Karnak. And the New York Times on the web that day, um, I think this had some logo glitch, but uh, the logo is usually up there. But it is something when you think back and you look at those books that were distributed around the newsroom and you think of this crew in the newsroom knowing what they know and all the years that have gone into it to to understand exactly what they're making and how it's edited and what will be done and what's the headline and all this, are thrown into this world, this digital world where 
they can't edit something necessarily four times on this day, and but they probably did. And, and there is no nomenclature. There are no rules. You have to use these fonts. It's just really fascinating to think of all of that control for all of those years vanishing. So Tom and Lilliville started on a redesign of the A section, the front of the book, uh, together. And uh, Tom looked at Jonathan Heffler's um, Cheltenham's, actually, because they were gorgeous, and but decided that those Cheltenhams were a little bit too refined. They were too stylish in a way, and he was looking for something that would really anchor the news. And so he looked to the ATF, uh, ATF book and found Chelt in there, the king of all type, and used that. And Matthew Carter came in and drew a range of weights of Chelt. And what you see here, uh, is sort of interest fascinating that the chelt on the right is the Matthew Carter ATF draw, and the one on the left is Jonathan Heffler's. And it's really hard to see on this screen. Even big, it's really hard to see, but the differences are um, to some profound and to some not, but they are, they're definitely there. Both extremely, um, extremely beautiful typefaces. Uh, this is the first all chelt page. And when you talk about change and when you think of, you know, T and Janet and all these things happening, this is big for the front of the New York Times. So you see on the right the chelt, Tom taking something and really refining it and streamlining it and simplifying it and bringing the font families together so there's not so many. Um, looking at that and uh, you know, people may have noticed and people may have not, but all in the interest of a very thoughtful evolution of something that uh, doesn't really need fixing but needs clarifying. The New York Times printed this uh, for its readers. Uh, as it's done, every, every change it makes, there's a little note that goes out to the reader saying, you know, let us inform you, and this is exactly what we're doing, and we want you to know about it. Um, and so Matthew Carter uh, has been a part of the New York Times for a long time. And um, he even now, uh, when things happen, people are starting to use a new typeface uh, uh, for another country and they're missing punctuation. Matthew gets a call and it's a very long-term um, very wonderful relationship we have with him. And I'm not going to talk about the uh, International Herald Tribune, but um, Matthew was a big part in the drawings of these, which, uh, which have evolved as we see over time. And that's a whole other crazy story, but most recently, um, when we first redesigned the International Herald Tribune and, and the Times took it over and made it all Chelt, uh, this was drawn, this mast was drawn by Matthew, and uh, he based it on the fracture that he had worked with Janet on. And so it had a character to it that was different than the Ed Bangat character that was the masthead for the New York Times. So when we changed to the International New York Times, um, a lot was discussed, and it was decided to let go of the Bangat and go with the New York Times drawing. And you can see here, I didn't highlight anything, so maybe hard, but you can see here, when you look at the brackets on the serifs, the Bengat fracture has a chiseled, uh, quite distinctive, sharp edge to it, pretty universally geometric. And the one that Matthew had drawn, the fracture, has um, these curves, these bracketed serifs. You see, um, two different A's also, and this is uh, Matthew really exploring fracture and where you could go with it. These are the A's that uh, Matthew sent over as sort of, which one do you want to use? They're, they're benefits to many. And This is the International Herald Tribune, which was uh, redesigned with all of the New York Times. It was um, not in Chelt before, it was in a whole different world. 
So they sort of brought it closer into the Times family and still kept it looking like a European uh, newspaper. Non-format, which is a design studio uh, with offices overseas and here, um, did this fracture on steroids for um, Gale in the magazine, in the New York Times magazine. Uh, we hired them to do this insider logo, which is a beautiful, is a, uh, insider is a, is a program for people who are loyal to the Times who want to read more about it, basically, and is in stages of evolution even now. But they did this, um, let's see if we get it. They did this um, beautiful little animation to show. And we had, uh, we had long, long phone conversations about what makes uh, a letter form human and how to balance out uh, the computer's effect on the drawing and really built into this one word mark, um, not only a, a glorious discussion about it, but uh, quite a quirky, you know, when you look at it up close, quite a quirky um, mark. When uh, T Magazine lost its T, we took it over for the corporate T, and Matthew drew a version that wasn't quite as fat, but wasn't quite as thin. And this is the T that you see now um, everywhere throughout the company. Uh, Matthew also helped us uh, with Karnak when we were redesigning the features. He uh, tweaked Karnak. Um, which I think was in his favorite font. So uh, he made a round dot on the I square. He reduced the relationship of the cap height to the X height. Uh, a lot of refined work was done on that. And this is just a, a waterfall. And this is just, you know, newspapers, when you think of the lengths you can go to and the beauty that you can get out of very tiny type hierarchies, which I happen to love, um, this is just, these were where we were workshopping all of the different kinds of things that might be done um, in the new features. So the universe expands and digital happens and we start to look at a world now, this is more, a more contemporary world where uh, things move things have dimension. Uh, online has come so far, and as we know now, we just anticipate it'll keep going. So there's really going to be no end to how dimensionally we can use typography to tell stories and to evoke uh, the emotions we want to evoke. And uh, I'm going to show you a few things uh, that um, were done by Work Order, who we hired to do video. They redid our entire video system. Using all chat, we needed something that wasn't uh, for broadcast, that was for uh, a different kind of media company, and felt very comfortable with this very unique kind of identity that they had. stop that because I noticed we're running out of time so or actually we're way over time I'm sorry so I'll go more quickly now this is a, a launch that work order did for us uh, really beautiful work um, we start to question um, uh, here is a magazine animation that work order did for the magazine Uh, this is Rem Duplessis working on the magazine with Gail, and Gail also recently redesigned, going back to type books, and I'll go faster now. Uh, this is work that um, Gail did uh, improving the logo. Changing the A. This was done with Matthew. Relaxing it. Doing alternate social media vehicles. This was a new open that she did.
This is the original stymie in the magazine. This is uh, the font that Gail drew with Hendrik. And serif. And this is an interesting uh, serif face that takes up the fracture, uh, tries to use the fracture um, architecture a bit to bring it back in, which Gail was very interested in doing. They did a text font as well. And here are Gail's notes to Henrik and, and what the discussion was around this is when you're working with a typographer that there really is a point at which you want to make them tell you what to do because it is a, it's a dangerous world um, when left on one's own. This is Gail's cover. She did four covers for the launch of the magazine. These are some of her other covers. T, um, T's uh, pet is changed and Deborah Needleman took it over and Patrick Lee and, and Sean Carney uh, uh, worked on all the typography for T. They worked with commercial type on this uh, typeface, Schneider. And uh, Sean actually drew this, uh, drew the beginnings of this and really collaborated with them on it. And it's, it's quite an extraordinary extensive uh, typeface family. Uh, the thing about it is that it has uh, vertical weights that stay the same no matter how wide the letters go, and the letters go incredibly wide in some instances. And these are notes uh, as they're working together, and this is actually uh, in use. And I'm going to go fast, sorry. That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> in, in, uh, in 2015, uh, there, it is a, it, an increasing question for us uh, what our identity is. And uh, I have a brand identity group at the company and we work uh, on various things in the company that are at various stages and some move very fast and online and there's some that move slower. Um, it is seeking what identity is uh, a good part of the time because we have an extraordinary and growing amount of um, products, properties, uh, uh, things that need definition, that need defining, and we're increasingly looking for ways to make them feel like the times. And Jeff Roth, um, our, our archivist in the morgue, found this Grafis article about the times written sometime in the 60s. And so I think about this a lot, and what this says is, it was written about the times, it says, this identity is achieved not by the imposition of a style, as is the case with many firms where even the type selection is uniform, but simply by high standards of taste and meaningfulness applied consistently to both copy and design of everything that bears the newspaper's imprint. So this is stating that there's some DNA, there's some way of looking at the world of approaching subject matter of respect for the reader that is not based on typography, actually. This is the world I live in now. And we are working very hard to go through it and rein it in uh, and make it consistent as we expand uh, globally. This was the marketing world that we were in until Laura Ford and David Rubin and her team, Laura Ford's wonderful design team showed up and and started realizing that if you make something feel like quality, people will want it, as opposed to having a fire sale. So they've been working on beautiful work uh, that is uh, so appropriate, and instead of a 99 cent sale now, you have something that matches the era, the event, the time that you're in, and it is um, astonishingly effective. We have products that are popping up all the time, uh, we're working on a lot of things. Uh, we have magazines in China now, and, and we're going into Latin America, Australia, newsletters. There's a huge range, and we look across this landscape and uh, try to identify those things that make us important in the world. This is Wirecutter, a new property that uh, we just bought that's uh, 
the, pro the project here is we need to make them look like the times, but we really can't make them look like the times because they are, they are like the wild child that you want to remain wild, basically. So it, it's really interesting issues that come up. Snapchat and social media uh, is probably the most difficult area because the conversation is when you're talking to people that um, these are off platform and these are places and spaces that speak to the group of the group that, that is engaged with them. So in discussion about Snapchat, uh, it's looking at what language are you speaking in? Are you speaking in that platform's language or are you speaking in the Times language? And this can be more or less effective, but we're, we're, we're still saying maybe we don't have pink type on an angle. Maybe that's not exactly who we are and why not do something a little more uh, as these are. This comes out of uh, Andrew Kuhneman's group and Steve Duenas that work on interactives and this is a Instagram video. And the, it is about the storytelling. It's not about the, the fuss that you layer over it. It's really about what you're saying and maybe that is the key uh, to getting by. This I put in here is a, um, from Andrew Kuhneman's group in Duenas and Interactive. And then we'll finish up. This is a piece they obviously put together uh, for an event to showcase their work. So it really animates um, beyond what you would experience online. These things um, come in combination with 360 video and VR. They come in combination with, you know, the products and uh, every every area that we enter into. Um, the dynamic range of what has to go on there um, is expanding. So this is a newsroom in this is a newsroom in 1920. Uh, this is a newsroom in 2016 on election night. So these are both election night photographs. And uh, the striking thing at moments like this, you realize, is that, uh, you know, in, in 1920, they made one thing. They made one thing. They made it really well. In 2016, the landscape is this. And on election night, you know, it's the responsibility of the press. It is where where we excel, actually, but that has expanded beyond belief. So we're on Facebook Live, we're live blogging, we're Twittering, we have an election night special event at which the publisher shows up and all the opinion columnists show up. We have uh, people tweeting from the newsroom what's happening. We have an Instagram being curated. All of these things are happening simultaneously and more. You know, we have journalists all over the globe covering these events. So when you think of doing all of this and doing it well, and the resources it takes, and how to really keep your feet on the ground. It's, um, it's quite an astonishing time. So this was um, print. And we were building the print, print, as usual, goes along with everything else on that night. And this is uh, Tom Bodkin. Um, looking at the kerning. We had, uh, we had done uh, a lot of variations of chelt weight styles, but really still harkening back to a man on the moon when you think of it, this big headline stacked, uh, staggered decks under it. So, so you know, it's a funny thing that, um, you know, in the world, um, print still has value as, uh, as an object, as a thing, as a, a sort of material marker for an event. And this latest campaign we did was um, black and white. It was all typography, very simply done, uh, very, very heavily thought through uh, by uh, uh, David, and David Rubin and Laura Ford in, in the marketing department working with Doga 5. And, 
um, quite astonishing how people gravitated toward it. It had nothing fancy. And, and uh, I just would like to say, in closing, that uh, our success in the end, uh, whether in print or online, is to just uh, really keep our focus on the clarity, the integrity, the passion, and, and the beauty uh, and the typography of our storytelling. That's it.